Welcome to this episode of Kennedy Saves the World. Um, I read an excerpt from a brand new book that was, the excerpt was so fascinating. I had to get the book and now I'm lucky enough to be talking to the author, Ian O'Connor, Out of the Darkness, The Mystery of Aaron Rodgers. There's the book. There's Aaron Rodgers. There's Ian O'Connor's name. Um, Ian, welcome to Kennedy Saves the World. Oh, great to be on, Kennedy. How are you? So you've written a lot of sports books. You know, you've written uh, not just football. You've written about uh, Derek Jeter. Saw him this weekend at the Old Timers game at Yankee Stadium. Uh, Belichick, is is that your best-selling book to date? Actually, Jeter is. No, I don't blame. Yeah. I don't blame anyone. What what a wonderful person Derek Jeter is uh, to be contrasted with Aaron Rodgers, who's who is a mystery, but he's also incredibly fascinating. And I want to know from you, because obviously when you're pouring yourself into hundreds and hundreds of interviews and you're spending so much time on one person, how do you decide on Aaron Rodgers when there are so many characters within sports, you know, across the world. How did you zero in on his story? Well, uh, to start with the iconic coach of Green Bay Packers, Vince Lombardi, uh, coached high school and also lived about eight houses down from where I grew up. So I was always fascinated by Packers mystique and aura and all those things. And so I wanted to write a Packers book at some point in my career. Aaron got traded into my backyard and I was scheduled to write a biography of LeBron James thought this would be a good time to pip because you have an all-time great quarterback leaving an iconic franchise with the Packers to go to what has been a loserville franchise in the Big Apple. So he's going from the smallest market to the biggest market in the NFL. And it just struck me that this would be a, a, the right time to tell his story. He had not had a defining biography written about him. I thought he probably was the most prominent American male athlete who didn't have that. So... I just thought the time was right before his career was over to try to paint the full picture of who he is, not only as an athlete, but as a human being. And from a distance, I always found him to be mysterious, compelling, and fascinating. And that's why I took the project on. Yeah, and it's interesting because at this point in any other pro's career, they would kind of be fizzling. And, you know, even with Tom Brady, before he retired, we knew that he had signed a big multi-hundred deal, dollar deal with Fox Sports and, you know, still waiting for that to materialize. That'll be super fun, though. Uh, but Aaron Rodgers, he's one of these people that through sheer force of will, he continues to heal himself, take non-traditional means uh, to expand his mind. He dabbles in politics and conspiracy theories, uh, which it all lends itself to the interestingness of you know, this third act in his football career. And, you know, on top of all that, because we know about the famous women that he's dated, but what I didn't realize was the depth of his family feud until I read that excerpt and started reading your book, Out of the Darkness. Were you surprised that you were able to talk with as many family members and interview Aaron Rodgers as well? To some extent, Kennedy, I, I thought that... His parents had never really given an interview, or at least a full interview in depth about the estrangement. And particularly as it related to Olivia Munn, uh, I had been told going into the uh, research of this book and reporting of this book, they felt she was largely to blame for the estrangement. Obviously, Aaron was dating her back in 2014, late that year when the estrangement really started. So they, they were willing to address that. And some things that she had said on Andy Cohen's uh, podcast about the family and uh, disputing some things she said. And, but Aaron did say, and he talked about it on the record, too. And frankly, I don't believe he's ever done that before. And I was a little surprised that, that he was willing to engage on that subject when I sat with him in his backyard in Malibu. His backyard is the Pacific Ocean, so it's the nicest backyard I've ever had an interview in, that's for sure. But he, uh, he did say that actually Olivia is really blameless in this because I had some thoughts and issues with my family before I even met her. And I think what Olivia Munn's role was, she confirmed his thoughts. One relative of Aaron's told me that he found a comrade in her who actually agreed with what he felt, and but he hasn't dated her in seven years and the estrangement continues, so clearly it's not all her fault or her doing. But um, yeah, there, there are, there's not one defined issue that 
is the cause of this fracture in the family. There are really about 15 things. And I was surprised by that. I, I did think it was going to be one thing. And so it's complicated, like most family divisions are. And so I think for the first time, I was able to detail those issues. And it's, it's unfortunate that it's gone on for 10 years. Aaron did say in the book that he wants to have a relationship with his father after they had a, an emotional scene and hug at Lake Tahoe last summer at the Celebrity Golf Tournament. So I'm hoping that that scene, that moment is the first step towards reconciliation. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that, you know, and, and this is a family of faith. Ed and Darla, you know, they, they raise their kids in a religious household. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's interesting that Aaron's like, yeah, I, I want to see my dad, but not a lot of love there for his brothers or for his mom. But, you know, when you read the book, when you read the story and you start to tease some of these things out, you realize they can all kind of be true at once. Like, of course, as human beings, you know, when we watch someone else's story and drama unfold, we want the, the causes to be pretty simple. But that's not the case here. And as I'm reading this and I'm reading about Aaron Rodgers, you know, I think it's pretty typical of an athlete this talented. You know, someone, because athletes are groomed from a very, very young age and their parents have to go all in on their training as mm -hmm. a family. And then when someone actually realizes that and, you know, is a Super Bowl winning, you know, cultural icon and, and so much money and access comes with that, um, you want to keep your family on your side, but it's really easy for your family, you know, maybe in the midst of jealousy to kind of try and drag you down while you're bringing them up at the same time. So, you know, reading this, I felt like his family was absolutely taking advantage of him. But, you know, there's a really interesting line in here about someone in the Green Bay organization that said, Aaron Rodgers, if you get in a fight with him, you are dead to him. So he has that quality for sure. And the family members that I spoke with, friends that are close to the situations ed and darla they're nice people i, I spent time with them, and they don't see it the same way i don't believe he had those feelings of his generosity with family members was not fully appreciated and that the the family was revolving too much around his success and they don't see it that way they don't think they did anything wrong at all of course what matters is aaron's perception his perception is driving the estrangement and he did have those feelings so who's right and who's wrong? There's a lot of he said, he said, he said, she said in this. I come from a big Irish Catholic family. We've had our share of issues over the years. They are complicated. Everyone has his or her own truth when it comes to it. But at the end of the day, Aaron is the one, again, who has set the terms of engagement or, in this case, disengagement with yeah. his family. And I asked him, well, when does it end? And, and one of his friends told me, does and they asked the question, Aaron, does the punishment fit the crime here? And he did say that he has gotten close to reconciliation on a few occasions and that every time he got close, something weird happened. So I guess this time around, I hope something weird doesn't happen. And he could start with his father and then go from there. Don't go anywhere. More Kennedy saves the world right after this. Yeah, and I know one of his brothers was on The Bachelorette mm -hmm. <laughs> and and blabbed about the family because it's very interesting because Aaron Rodgers sort of paints himself as this private person, but we know so much about his private life. So that is coming from somewhere. Can he be both things at once? Can he be an attention seeker and someone who really enjoys fame, but at the same time, is he super controlling and does he want to keep the aspects of his life private that he he wants to can is he is he like prince harry is he trying to have it both ways that's an excellent question it really is you're the first person I, i've done a lot of interviews and that that really is the first time i've been asked that question and it's a very good one there is a dichotomy there and frankly i think later in life he's been more willing to talk about his personal life and and really he's become like this fearless public speaker and not many people are, including myself. So on a certain level, I, I commend him for that. He was more private when he was younger. Now, Jordan, his brother, went on The Bachelorette in 2016. So we're talking eight years ago. And I don't think Aaron was nearly as public then as he is now as, as a, a football player and public figure. 
But he was upset because on that episode, Jordan talked about the estrangement. The estrangement at that point was less than two years long. And they filmed a scene where they, at the dinner table, they had two empty chairs signifying the absence of Aaron and Olivia Munn. And Aaron told me I wasn't even invited to that session. And I'm not saying I would have gone, but if you're going to sort of embarrass me with that scene, at least have an invitation on the front end of it. So I, I would agree with him on that. But he just didn't, the way he saw it was Jordan was using the straight to further his TV career. I'm told Jordan feel, doesn't feel the same way, but again, Aaron's driving this thing. And he perceived that to be the case. Uh, he is now, right, he's, he's definitely more willing in recent years to, to talk about uh, personal things in the public forum. And really, his life changed in August of 21 when he said, yeah, I've been immunized. Those four words when he was unvaccinated changed his entire life. And I think what happened was media commentators and columnists who used to praise him for being on the right side of social issues like Colin Kaepernick turned on him and he decided to dig in and if you want a war i will give you a war and sometimes he's defending indefensible positions but yeah he's uh fearless in uh in talking about a lot of things at public and he's committed some unforced errors some self-inflicted wounds and that's why his image today is what it is yeah and i i do think in terms of the vaccination i think there are a lot of people now who are second guessing uh, the the vaccinations and the boosters that they've gotten. I think history will be kinder to him there. Uh, but yeah, it, it was I, a I, little bit can misleading. I make what he said. So yeah, he, he certainly didn't change his stance, and I wasn't there to change his opinion on that. I just asked him, Kennedy, why didn't you just tell the truth that day when you were asked if you were vaccinated? Because his truth was that he was allergic to an ingredient in Pfizer and Moderna, and concerned about Johnson and Johnson side effects. And I said, Aaron. I can't guarantee this because I wasn't in the room, but if I were a sports columnist sitting there representing Green Bay or Milwaukee outlet, I was vaxxed. But if you said that, I, I find that to be a somewhat reasonable position. I really don't think I would have hammered you in my column that day. I think you would have gotten less than 50% of the criticism you ended up getting three months later when the truth came out that you weren't vaccinated. And he effectively said, yeah, I should have told the truth. So I, I didn't mean to suggest that he was wrong, because as a professional athlete competing at the highest level, I understand his decision on the vaccine, taking it or not, is different from mine. His body is everything to his success, and he needs to be functioning at an optimal level to be an all-time great. And so his decision was different from mine, and I wasn't there to certainly try to change his mind, and I would have failed with that anyway. But I, I thought he at least admitted that he made a mistake and he shouldn't have misled the public. That's all. And yeah. And but, you know, credit. there were other athletes like Novak who did the, the same thing. Like, you know, he didn't want to take the vaccine either. And, you know, he could have compromised his overall legacy and how many majors he won uh, by not taking. But but he he was at least more honest. And, and maybe Aaron Rodgers signed with the Jets because of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Well, he told me he joked with uh, Christopher Johnson is the vice chairman of the Jets. And obviously, Woody Johnson is the owner. They're brothers. They're from the Johnson and Johnson family. And I asked Aaron if he had ever joked with Woody, uh, the owner, about not taking the uh, the J and J shot. And he said he had joked with Christopher about it, and uh, it seemed to be in all in fun, I guess. But no, I I uh, I certainly wasn't at all trying to uh, change his stance on that, and he was never going to do that anyway. It was all about. Why you're a fearless public speaker? Why did you always tell your truth? Why didn't you do it in that situation? He basically said, "I should." Yeah, and it's one of those things where I kind of feel for the guy because once you've said something like that, you can't unring that bell. And you know, even if you make the admission a couple months later, like I should have just said it, and I don't know why I didn't say it. You know, people are by and large forgiving, but so much damage was done in that moment. So why do you think um, he's attracted to? these kind of mercurial, higher profile relationships that don't always seem to end well. Funny you ask me because he, he was engaged to a woman from his hometown, Chico, California. Destiny Newton was her name. So that hot pot of coffee, that was the one he had a crush on forever. That's correct. So we're going back about, uh, I don't know, 12 years or so. And his family members and friends that I talked to, and a lot of them wanted him, were sort of rooting for that one to work and get to marriage. 
because they felt that Destiny being a local young woman who is not an actress kept that group together and maybe the family that would still be together and some friendship that he ended would still be intact and it's not the case. I don't know the answer to that question and perhaps when I sat with him in Malibu, I should have asked, but I do know that those relationships have ended in part. Danica Patrick and Shailene Woodley both talked about really sounding brokenhearted after the, uh, the relationship ended that the public scrutiny of, or the scrutiny of being public figures, both parties in the relationship really was a factor in the end of those relationships. So uh, the specific reason I think uh, is, is not something that is certainly not something that Aaron shared with me, but he did talk about the scrutiny and how that uh, had a negative impact on, on those relationships. And the other thing he said to me, I was sitting in his house and looking around, it's like, wow, this, you're a self-made person because he came out of high school, didn't have a single scholarship offer, had to go to the local community college, even at 13 town as SATs. And he created this hall of fame career all by himself. And so I asked him, when did you, when did you buy this house again? Was it 2018 or 2019? So we're talking about a house he purchased for $28 million in Malibu, right on the ocean. I'm sure today it's worth a lot more than that. He said 2019. And by the way, I bought it by myself. So, cause reports were at the time he bought it with Dan Patrick. So the implication is that they each paid $14 million. He wanted me to know that I, this was my $28 million house, nobody else's. And, uh, I thought that was a very interesting observation that he made. Yeah, you know, and like, I, I thought that was interesting you put that in the book because that that was a tell, but that's also, you know, it, it kind of made me think that, you know, when when things end amicably, people always tag on, but I wish her well. I think Danica's amazing. She's an incredible race car driver. I'm so glad we're still friends. You don't hear that from him about his past relationships, which makes me think that, you know, with some of his girlfriends, the reason they're so brokenhearted is because he just ends it. Like, he's cold-hearted. Like, when he's done, he is done. And he extricates himself from these complicated emotional relationships, whether it's with women or his family. And you have to think, like, it's a brutal way to live. And ultimately, you know, those kind of patterns lead to loneliness. But maybe there's something in that that makes him an incredible football player. Do you see anything there? I do. Um, another really good question because uh, one of his, his best friend, really, Jordan Russell, I have him in the book. He actually was exiled out of Aaron's life. And I have a chapter titled The Island in my book. And that's where Aaron puts people. And usually they never escape the island. It's a very cold, lonely, and distant place. There's no cell phone service for, no FaceTime connections with Aaron, nothing. You're done when you're on the island. And if you talk to somebody on the island, you're probably going to be the next person put there. So Jordan Russell was on the island after three or four years. Aaron actually brought him back. And he said that Aaron is a, he's a master of his craft. And he is seeking perfection. His craft happens to be full. If you're not mission aligned, if you're a distraction in any way, he's going to move you out of the way. And that's going to be the end of that relationship. I don't know why Jordan Russell was pulled back in, but one day he got a phone call from Aaron after three or four years saying, I want you back in my life. And Jordan said, only if you, only if you give me your respect. I'm not just walking back into your life. I command and demand your respect. And so they worked that out and they are friends today. At least they were as of a month ago. I'm assuming that's still the case, but he did say that if you are not, if you're a hurdle, if he perceives you to be a hurdle on his mission to be an all time great football player, you will be removed. So let's talk about the mission. Do you think that he's healed? Do you think that we're going to see something extraordinary that remains in his career? Yeah, and when he took on the challenge of New York, which I think was a necessary challenge, he needed to change the dynamic of his career in Green Bay. It was one bitter postseason defeat after another. Tom Brady has seven championship rings. Aaron has one. And there's no way to close that gap. At this one point. more than Dan Marino. That's one more Dan Marino. <laughs> one more than a lot of guys. It's hard yeah, to win. Jim Kelly. That's what, and and uh, Tom Brady made it look easy. That's the problem. That's Aaron's problem is that he's compared to the guy who made it look easy. And it is very hard to win one. And we've seen that over time. But uh, yeah, I think that the he realized he needed to change. The Packers wanted to move on to Jordan Love, just like they wanted to move on to Aaron Rodgers in 2008 when they pushed Brett Favre to the Jets. 
So, but New York's a great opportunity for him. The Jets have not been to the Super Bowl since January of 1969. I always say they haven't stepped in the Super Bowl since Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. That's a long time. <laughs> And so, that's such a brutal perspective. Yeah, Jeff but it's so that. true. I, I bring that up. That's sort of my go-to line when it comes to the dra- the championship drought of the Jets. But going to New York makes a lot of sense for Aaron because if he wins a championship in the Big Apple for a, a Charlie Brown franchise, it's going to feel like three or four championships. And his legacy, if he finishes his career doing that in New York, it's going to explode. I think he's back up there. I'm not going to say he's on Tom Brady's level, but I think he's back up there with Joe Montana and, and Patrick Mahomes. So, yeah, it, it actually made a lot of sense for him to do this at age 39 and now 40. Well, as as a Joe Montana 49ers fan, I would say it goes Joe Montana, Tom Brady, and then really? a bunch, bunch of other... Yeah, I think Joe... Uh, Tom think Brady's fine. Player? Joe Montana, absolutely. Yes, he was, and and the history will will remember it thusly. He's like Michael Jordan to Tom Brady's LeBron James. Like you, you can talk about them, and and Tom Brady is really good, but he'll never be Joe Montana. And yes, I am completely biased as a Forty ers fan. And Aaron Rodgers should have been a San Francisco Forty er as a member of the faithful. I will always believe that, and you know, I want to believe in the guy. Um, the story is not finished. Your book is compelling and fascinating. We can all see ourselves and our own family dynamics in here, even though they don't play out on a massive global stage like it has for him and his family. And all I can hope for him is that there are reconciliations and that, you know, through psilocybin or whatever, you know, I don't know if it's mushrooms or ketamine or MDMA, but that he finds some sort of psychic healing and and reconciles with his family. Yeah, and in some strange way, Kennedy, I hope that this book would somehow help uh, and not hurt. I really didn't want it to hurt the process. So, yeah, I, I would love to see that happen. Frankly, when he won the Super Bowl, his entire family, including his grandparents, they were on the field celebrating with him afterward. And so I hope that could happen with the New York Jets at some point. We'll see how it unfolds. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it is absolutely possible. The fact that he knew that you had already spoken to his family and he agreed to talk to you, I think that in itself is a step forward. Uh, I encourage everyone for your late summer reading, Out of the Darkness. And uh, Ian O'Connor is the author. Ian, thank you so much for taking time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kennedy. I've been a fan for a long time. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. This has been Kennedy Saves the World, along with Ian O'Connor. I'm Kennedy. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts and Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app. Oh, go ahead and leave me a review while you're there. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You've been listening to Kennedy Saves the World on the Fox News Podcast Network.